actually being able to detect some of this stuff. W w uh, it's because of, uh, I think, and you, you'll correct me, I'm sure if I'm wrong, that the, that the, uh, that the discovery of brains in some sense has driven the, to an interesting idea that maybe originally the whole idea of string, uh, string theory was these extra dimensions were very, very small, and that's the reason you couldn't see them. But a very, another interesting possibility has, has arisen, and that is that they might not be so small and they could be invisible because only gravity can detect them and gravity is very weak. But that large, the fact that they can be larger leads to something interesting. So why don't you go on to that? Yes, so you're, you're absolutely right. One of the developments from the mid-1990s that we alluded to before, that it's not just strings, it's also membranes and three-dimensional blob-like entities, people came up with the idea that perhaps we actually might be living on one of those entities. And it's hard to picture in the actual three dimensions, so a two-dimensional analogy I think is pretty good. If you imagine, for instance, a, a loaf of bread, maybe we'll just stop, stop right there with a loaf of bread. We, we didn't give you breakfast this morning? Yeah, no, was that no, no, so you have, the, have this loaf of bread, and um, <laughs> Imagine that what we have long thought to be the entire universe is just one slice of bread. So a two-dimensional version of the real three-dimensional story. And the idea is that there may be other slices, other brains, that we don't see because all of the ways that we access the world, except for gravity, I'll mention in a moment, are kind of trapped on our slice of bread. The strings can freely move along our slice, but they can't get off of it. So photons, that's how we usually see things. The photons can freely move along our slice, but they can't get off. That's why we're unable to see the other dimensions. But these theories also show that since gravity, it turns out, is associated with a snippet of string in which the ends are tied together into a loop, it's not stuck to the brain. The open strings of which we are made are stuck by their endpoints, but when the endpoints come together and yield a little particle of gravity, it can escape and it can probe into the other dimensions. So the idea is, maybe at the Large Hadron Collider, now imagine there's a collider on this piece of bread. So you've got protons going opposite directions around this collider. They slam into each other and it's possible, the calculation shows it's possible that some of the debris from the collision would be these graviton particles that could fly off of the piece of bread and we'd notice that by having a little less energy after the collision on our slice than before because the gravitons would carry away energy with them. So that's one of the exciting possibilities that, a, that, that might happen at the Large Hadron Collider. It's, it's a exciting remote possibility. There's also yeah. something else that's gotten a lot of press. You may be, because it changes the nature of gravity in these extra dimensions, gravity acts a little bit differently in order for these theories to work, you might be able to create kind of black holes that might do something interesting. And, and, and that's fascinating people, but it's also caused a lot of uh, public uh, press and concern. So uh, maybe you want to talk about that for a second. Yeah, uh, you know, when the Large Hadron Collider was doing its initial runs some months ago, I'm sure it was the case with you too, I, I got so many phone calls All the time. to be on this or that program, yeah. and I was like, wow, physics is really, you know, its stature has <laughs> risen, but they only cared about this idea of black holes that Destroy. might be formed in Geneva and sort of eat up Switzerland and then... Yeah. <laughs> Which wouldn't be so bad per se, but then if it went on, you know, it, actually, you know, it would, it would have helped the, the whole financial I'm crisis. I'm telling you, that's right. Gone, or is a, 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 a reasonably good metaphor. Yeah. Um, but um, the idea is a serious one. Yeah. And scientists in our community have done calculations. I mean, you, if you create this little black hole, what would happen? Could it eat up the world around it? And the answer is, is no. And the calculations, number one, they show, based on fairly well-established physics, that these little tiny black holes would disintegrate in a tiny fraction of a second before they could cause you know, any trouble at all. But even more so, if you don't think that's a convincing argument, these collisions that we can create at the Large Hadron Collider, however powerful they may seem to us, are very weak compared to collisions that are happening in our atmosphere right now. Cosmic ray particles are slamming into our atmosphere with energies far in excess of anything that we'll be able to achieve at the Large Hadron Collider. So little black holes, if they were going to be created in Geneva, would be created there. And if they're created up in space and they're not causing any problems here, well, we should be fine. Some will come back and say, but hang on a second. You create the black hole up there in space and it has a speed from the incoming particles. Maybe it just rushes through the Earth before it can create any problems. So the final way to answer that is, these kinds of collisions also would happen near neutron stars. Uh -huh. And neutron stars are sufficiently powerful that they'd hold on to this little tiny black hole. So if black holes eat things up, 
we should see neutron stars disappearing, and, and we don't. So the stability of the universe around us pretty much shows, shows us, us that there's not a problem. Yeah, and the, moon, the other example that's been used is the moon, because it doesn't even have an atmosphere. Yeah, they sure. slam the fact that the right moon, into when it, you yeah. look up at night, there's a moon, it gives you good confidence that they're probably not there. Um, mm. But uh, what do you do during new moons? <laughs> well, that's true. Um, <laughs> so half the time you're worried. Half the time, you're, exactly. You sleep half the month. Mm. Um, the, uh, well, uh, let me ask you before we move on to the last thing, because I want to leave time for questions um, from other people. Uh, uh, this, uh, this idea of extra dimensions, I mean, it, it is kind of sexy, the idea that we might create them. And I, I am, I'm excited about one of my, actually, one of my students uh, was one of the people who proposed it, as you know, Raman Sundar, yeah. when I taught at Yale. And I like to say I was really happy about it because it got him tenure. But I think it's pretty ugly. What do you think? I don't find those theories from a mathematical standpoint compelling. Yeah, okay. So what we were talking about earlier, you know, you get, you're guided by mathematical aesthetic at times, and I don't find that these fit into that. They don't fit into string theory very easily, do they? I mean, it, we, we don't talk about it. I mean, it's just, they seem contrived to me, and I just wonder whether you agree. I, I, I agree with that. The only hesitation I have is, you know, when something's right, we somehow have the ability to go back and modify our aesthetic so yeah. that, so, that, so I, that's no, what I'm unsure about. And now that's, you know, actually that leads to the nice segue to the last thing I want to talk about briefly. Uh, because one of the things that I wish more people understood, especially I was down in Texas recently talking at the school board there, that the universe is the way it is, w whether we like it or not. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and if more people could just get used to that idea that, that it's nature that tells us how to behave, not us telling nature. It'd be an interesting thing. So it is absolutely true. Many things have seemed ugly. Black holes seemed ugly. So, uh, but then once you realize that might happen, you reassess quantum mechanics. All these things seem weird, and we have to adjust our minds to understand them because, like it or not, that's the way nature works. And so maybe in the last two minutes, because I want to leave s s six or seven minutes at least for questions, um, you know, both you and I spend a lot of time trying to communicate. And, and, I wa uh, maybe, and, and we just did a little TV program the other day talking about that. Well, maybe you want to elaborate on why you think that's so important. Well, I think there are, there are a number of, of reasons that I give when I'm asked questions like that. And sort of depending on the setting, one or another answer I think is, is most powerful. You know, on the one hand, I truly believe, and I know you do too, that all of the issues and opportunities that we face going forward, the fundamental ones are scientific at their core, right? I mean, the opportunities with stem cells, the challenges with climate change, the possibilities with nanotechnology and, and you know, human space travel. I mean, all of these things are fundamentally scientific and alternate energy. So you need to have a public that's at least willing to engage with the ideas so that we are making the decision. It's not a decision that's being made on high and basically being presented to us. So I think... It, so the, I, in fact, I would argue that a healthy democracy depends on yes. that, not just in the public, but the legislators as well. We, you can make, if you make decisions in the absence of data, then they're, they're generally not good decisions. Yeah, I, learned I, in absolutely. Last eight years. So, I, so, I mean, I, I agree with that fully, but I, if you were to really ask me why I do what I do, why uh -huh. I take time out of research, uh -huh. to spend time popularizing science. And, and it is, there is a huge opportunity cost, right? Yes, I used to think that us. there wasn't. But there and is. that was when I, I, I wasn't married and I had no kids, yeah. right? So, so what I would do is I would do the writing at night yeah. and I'd do physics during the day and it simply meant I was watching less television yeah. or, or reading less books or yeah. things like that. But that's no longer the case. So there's a real opportunity cost. And the reason in my heart of hearts why I do it is not because of the issue that we just yeah. mentioned. It's important, but I do it because when I see a kid open up his or her eyes and say, oh my God, this is spectacular, it feels great. I agree. And that's why I do no, it. No, in fact, you know, uh, that, that, and for me, it's precisely come down to the same thing. It was a gift given to me. I read Isaac Asimov, I read, I read George Gamow, I read Albert Einstein, because he used to write popular books too. And, it, and for me, that's right. what turned me on. And so when I write a book and, and I see a kid, you know, and, and enough of them are old now, enough now that some of them say I became a physicist, because that, yeah. it's just. Yeah, exactly. Okay, well enough of, of that. Let's, let's go to the audience and, and, uh, and feel free to come and ask some questions. So, um, I can't, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. No, no, we'll just have to stay with that. Ready? Oh, good. Light, house lights are up so I can see now. Any questions? I guess, uh, are you at the microphone? Why don't you begin? Yes. Hello? You're Hello? on. Yeah, we can hear you. Uh, yes. Um, with the uh, Large Hadron Collider being able to possibly create energy densities that 